book uh, you might not have had about uh, people talking about end of life care because it is usually a neglected area or uh, people who works uh, in critical care uh, what to talk about end of life care is it actually necessary uh, so this is going to be very <coughs> interesting uh, topic mm, and even mm, i don't think uh, uh, none of us has learned how to take care of the dying patient which is not included in our undergraduate or postgraduate curriculum um so uh, we have a special faculty today uh, to deal with this uh, important topic dr frank b ferris uh, so he is the executive director of uh, palliative medicine research and education at the ohio health columbus and uh, he actually uh, has interest uh, in strategies for integrating palliative care into health care system worldwide and he has published and spoken uh, widely uh, on uh, multiple palliative care subjects and the effective approaches to education and program implementation um uh, he is a clinical associate professor of hospice and palliative care at Tokyo University and he is a, an adjunct adjunct assistant professor of internal uh, medicine at ohio state university clinical professor at department of family and preventive medicine and uh, assistant professor adjunct uh, department of family and community medicine university of toronto and there are many um, positions he holds uh, and uh, he has uh, many accomplishments and uh, one of this uh, is um, Uh, he is a co principal and the holder uh, in education on palliative and end of life care uh, uh, which is a very famous program uh, and he has also published uh, on the same um, and uh, uh, to speak about his uh, professional achievements and things i think uh, we would need for now so i am not uh, going to do that uh, but um, uh, from and that is from the professional point of view but from a personal point of view i think uh, uh, it is very important to tell you that uh, he is a very uh, simple and humble man uh, uh, which even i had an experience uh, so uh, i you know uh, uh, people from india when they go to the states uh, where they get lost and uh, in such situation uh, Uh, i think um, i had a very good experience uh, with uh, fan uh, who actually hosted us and uh, i still uh, cherish that memories uh, so um, uh, i think as a human being is great uh, uh, so with this uh, introduction uh, i would like to hand over the session to fan and uh, once again uh, i would uh, like to thank uh, frank uh, for agreeing uh, for taking a session on this important topic thank you very much frank my pleasure sinio good morning good evening depending on all of you early morning here evening for you i'm delighted to be able to join you can you all hear me okay uh, yes. yes yes doctor clearly perfectly all right so as sunil says let's talk about one of those topics that most of us have avoided talking about during our medical training i'd be very interested in all of you having your video on so we can have a little bit of interaction here as well because it makes it much more fun the last hours of life The reality is while a few of us will die suddenly most of us are going to have a prolonged illness experience whether it's respiratory failure or heart failure whether it's dementia or cancer maybe 2 3 or 4 of these within the process of the last days of our lives there are very unique opportunities and risks 
for most of us, we don't have a lot of experience with that. And if you watch the movies or television, everybody these days gets quite an exaggerated sense of the dying process. Fair enough, true in India as well? I suspect so. So to me, there's a phase of preparing and then there's a phase of managing the last hours. Let's start with the preparing phase and we'll continue with managing. To do this, we had the opportunity to talk with a wonderful woman, Jamie Brown. You're going to see her interviewed in short video clips by a great colleague of mine, Charles von Gunten. You can see how Jamie was in life a 62-year-old special education teacher who started off with a shoulder injury, but it actually proved to be advanced amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. She was admitted to hospice care, and we're interviewing her actually close to the end of her life. As she talks about approaching her death, let's hear what she has to say. Please just thumbs up if you could hear the video. Well, I have to um, intensify. I have to focus on quality rather than quantity. Um, you kind of cut to the chase. I, I feel like I've become blunt, excessively blunt maybe, and I, I don't have time to waste. I don't have time to waste. I've become blunt. I recognize there's things I need to do. So you and I, the doctors, we're the concierge guiding patients and their families through a process that they may not understand. It's not just about managing the shortness of breath, it's managing the whole person. After all, it's all about life, isn't it? That's why you and I are in medicine. So what tasks should dying patients complete before they die? There's a lot. Today, we think about asking people well, what kind of care would you like? The advanced care planning. Who will make decisions for you? Do you have a health care power of attorney? What about your finances, your bank accounts, your business, your legal planning? Will you make a trust, a will? Who will look after your children, your pets, other people who may be dependent? What about the spiritual questions, the opportunity for prayers, rites and rituals, reminiscence, and where would you like to die and who will provide the care? And is there an opportunity for a service, maybe even a celebration of life, a funeral, a memorial service, and would you like to donate your cornea, an organ, your body? These are all important questions. But of course, it's much bigger than that. How many of you, hands up, have some sort of social media account? Hands up. How many of you have email? How many of you have a smartphone? Yes. Well, do they have passwords? Do you use two-factor authentication? How big is your digital footprint? And what's going to happen with your digital world when you die? Who has the login information? The reality is many of these counts become frozen. And if you get rid of the person's telephone and they have two-factor authentication, you're never going to get them closed. Facebook is going to be the largest graveyard in the world by 2050. And of course, 
Maybe you already know what happens. Up pops the birthday message. Let's all celebrate her birthday. Problem is she died five years ago and nobody can stop it. It can be both positive, but can also be horrifying for family. Are you talking about the digital world to your patients before they die? It becomes incredibly important to make sure that there's a catalog of passwords and login information. It's also important for us to help people say goodbye. It's good for the patient, but it's wonderful for the family. Ira Biox said there are five things people need to say before they die. I love you. I hope you love me. I forgive you. I hope you forgive me. And finally, goodbye. Now, people don't know they need to say these things, but if you and I facilitate this, it makes an incredible difference. And again, depending on what people's spiritual beliefs or religious practices are, will they be able to choose a new partner or not? I would say there's one more thing. If I'm the person dying, can you help me say to my family, I will love you always. I hope you will never forget me. Please find a new partner and have a successful life. That was actually said to me as my partner died, and it was incredibly empowering. When it's not said, sometimes people are stuck believing they're still married and they don't move on. It can be very problematic because they said, I will be with you always when they were married. Again, it depends on the custom, the tradition of each person but it's important that we help people say goodbye. So the question is, are patients afraid of dying? Let's listen to Jamie and hear what she had to say. You know, I really don't fear death because of my faith. I believe that if I can get through this hard part, then what I'm going to, what's going to come next is going to be more incredibly amazing than anything I could imagine. And even I don't have words to try to describe that. Mm -hmm. But what I am afraid of is getting from here to there. I'm not afraid of death because my spiritual context and my beliefs are very strong, but I'm afraid of getting from here to there. So that's your responsibility and mine, isn't it? Helping her have safe and comfortable dying. And today we know how to do that. There's a real science to it. So let's talk about how do we manage the dying process. And before I do that, I would like to say the whole process of helping people prepare can be quite complicated. It's helpful to have people who are carefully trained to do this, to help you and I, you and me as a doctor. We don't have time for all of this, but we need to know that it should happen. So let's move on to the managing. It's important for us to be able to see the signs of the dying process and what are the issues to manage that we need to take responsibility for during the last hours of life. Listen to this short video. What do you hear as signs and issues? She's just not even responding. She's just you hear the sound okay? Here. She's been sleeping all day long and mm -hmm. Um, she made some kind of weird noises in her throat mm -hmm. and just really scared me. Yeah, I understand. So what I understand you to say is that over the past few days that she's been weaker yeah. and that she's been sleeping more, although she's had periods when she's been awake and mm -hmm. she's been able to eat and drink a little bit. 
yeah. and take her medicines, but the today that you haven't been able to wake her up. And her hand, I mean, her hand has just been like really cold. Well, I noticed the changes in her hands too. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed they're more cool mm -hmm. and they're a little bluish. Um, when I feel her pulse, it's quite weak. Mm -hmm. It's very thready. And when I watch her breathe, I see that it's very shallow. Mm -hmm. You notice it's just very gentle. Mm -hmm. So I think what I'd like to do is examine her and then maybe you and I can, and Maureen can talk about what I think is going on in the living room. Would that be all right? Okay. Well, Melissa, Maureen and I came over because of the changes in your mother. You know, Maureen's mm -hmm. been your hospice nurse for the last several weeks. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what you're making of what we're seeing with your mother today. And I don't know, I feel kind of confused because mm -hmm. you know, I thought that she would just keep going on the way she has been, but now she really seems different, like things aren't right. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of worried, you know, if, if she can't eat, then she's going to just get worse and I don't want her to just get worse. So, I mean, maybe we need to give her, you know, an IV or something like that. Mm -hmm. We could do an IV, mm -hmm. but I don't think it would make her better. I thought maybe you would say something like that. Did you? Yeah. Melissa, I'm afraid your mother's dying. I'm not sure exactly, but she may be dying in a day or two. Like that soon? It could be. So no matter what we do now, it's not going to help? No, I don't think anything we can do can stop her from dying. With the changes that we're seeing today, changes in her breathing, the changes in her hands. It makes me think that her body is shutting down. What can I do to help her? Well, I think it's important for you to remember that there's a lot of things that you can do for her. And mm -hmm. some of them you've already been doing. You've been keeping her mouth clean with the swabs that you've been using. Mm -hmm. And you've been making sure that her skin stays clean and dry. Mm -hmm. And you're going to continue to do those things. Mm -hmm. You can turn her on her side and put a pillow at her back for some support, mm -hmm. and that will help some of the secretions that you've been hearing in her throat drain out. So I, I think it's important for you to know that you're doing all the right stuff. Okay. I thought that I would have more time with her or something, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's why many people feel it's never the right time. Yeah. As Maureen said, you've been taking a wonderful job taking care of her. Mm -hmm. As you know, she said that she wanted to be comfortable and she wanted to die in her own home, in her own bed. And you're helping her do that. Is she in any pain? I don't see any signs of pain. Okay. I think if she is, if she seems like she's in pain, if she's grimacing, um, we can still give her some of the liquid pain medicine just inside her mouth, okay. inside her cheek. Will people help me with this? Well, I can contact the social worker at hospice and he can make some phone calls and we can certainly get some caregivers in here to help you out. That way you can just continue to be her daughter, mm -hmm. loving her and not giving her 24-hour care. Okay. So I agree with Maureen. There are many things that we can do for her right now. I think she can hear you. I think she mm -hmm. can feel your touch. Mm -hmm. Most people are afraid of dying alone and dying in pain. I think you can assure that neither of those things happen to your mother. That's a lot. Okay. What other questions do you have for us? I guess you, just to know that you'll be there. I may not be able to see your mother again before she dies. You can certainly get me by phone and Maureen can get me by phone. But the hospice team is gonna be able to be here help you and your family through this. I'll be sure to give you a call and so we can follow up. Okay. Okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. Thanks. So a very common scenario. A patient who's dying at home. How do you and I diagnose dying? Well, there's obviously the neurological failure and the signs of that. Altered level of consciousness happens in all sorts of situations. So it's not specific 
But if there are changes in breathing patterns or loss of ability to swallow and loss of gag reflex, these are pathognomonic that now the patient is actually dying. As a result, we may get buildup of oral or tracheal secretions. Concurrently, we might see changes in mental status, what we would call delirium. And of course, finally, loss of sphincter control. There's also the cardiac failure issues, changes in heart rate and blood pressure that lead to venous pooling and mottling, that bluing we might see along particularly extremities or at the back, cyanosis that we might see in lips, and as she described in the video, cooling of the extremities. And finally, that end organ failure, oliguria and anuria. So you and I need to make this diagnosis because now it's very different, isn't it? And usually it's a complex combination of several of these where we can say the patient is not just unwell, they are now actually dying. Now, you and I know if there's an arrhythmia or an arrest, people die suddenly, but most people die over hours to days and for me, the longest I've seen this has been actually close to four weeks, where a person was slowly using the fluid they had on board with delirium, with several signs, actually dying. Now, what are some of the issues that you heard? I mean, clearly there's the weakness and fatigue, the question of food and fluid intake, skin care. We have to adjust medications for renal dysfunction. And then the question of how are we gonna manage that shortness of breath, those secretions, the pain. And I will talk on why people can't close their eyes. If, if you see the whites of somebody's eyes, always families often get really upset. So let's talk about these. You and I need to move. We have proprioceptors in our joints and our muscles. And if you lie in bed for half an hour without moving, how do you feel? Have you ever tried it? I don't know about you, but I get really achy. So even for the person who's now so weak, they can't move, we still get joint position fatigue and the proprioceptors may cause a lot of discomfort. We need to teach families passive range of motion. And of course, we need to turn the patient in order to reduce the risk of pressure ulcers. Decreasing nutrition and fluid intake is one of those issues that really upsets families. Is that true in India? The patient can't eat, does the family start to push? How do we do it? Is there tension, maybe even anger, frustration? Fear that the patient is giving in? What you and I need to do is teach family that food might be nauseating, the anorexia is actually protective because there are actually ketones that are released, which are anesthetic agents. And of course, if the person has associated dysphagia, which goes along with so many different situations at the end of life, there's a high risk of aspiration. Now, we also need to talk to families about the clenched teeth if the patient's resisting, don't push. What I like to say is, let's reorient the family, move them to the foot of the bed away from the head so they stop pushing the food and they start doing touch, massage, and other activities. We can advise them to do things differently. Of course, the fear without taking fluids is that they'll get thirsty, but you and I know that thirst 
in a patient approaching end of life is actually about dry mouth. Dehydration by itself doesn't cause distress. And it also may be protective, adding to endorphins that are released as well as some of the ketones that are anesthetics. What you and I need to do is keep the mouth moist and we need to teach people how to do that. What I like to use is a baking soda mouthwash and I can share that formula with you and get the family cleaning the person's mouth routinely. You can make it right in the home. Five milliliters of salt, five milliliters of baking soda and some water. Now, of course, there's that decreased cardiac output, isn't there? The signs being the tachycardia, hypotension, the cooling, the modeling. What you and I need to recognize is in the face of diminished urine output, going to anuria, parenteral fluids will not likely reverse the situation. In fact, if the patient has hypoalbuminemia, parenteral fluids may be actually harmful. You and I have those three pressures, don't we? The hydrostatic force, the oncotic pressure that comes from albumin and the osmotic pressure. If I don't have enough albumin, I don't hold the fluids in the vascular space. And the space that's most at risk are the alveoli. If I got, give a lot of fluid, I may well create pulmonary edema as well as peripheral edema and add to the sense of restlessness, cough, and secretions. But of course, fluids are a potent symbol of medical care. In India, if you get admitted to hospital, does everybody get an intravenous? Yeah, everybody gets an intravenous, right? And it's just normal. And of course, families expect it. So the question becomes, can I actually safely run an intravenous in somebody with no urine output? And the answer is yes. Because we lose 250 milliliters per day through our perspiration and our respiration, I can replace about 500 milliliters per day, which means the IV can flow at about 20 milliliters per hour to keep the vein open. Now, for most families, they don't understand the drip rate. As long as they see the IV, they're now happy. Is that true in India? That just seeing it makes them happy. So you and I need to know this trick. I'm going to say this is theater to keep the families happy, but it's important that we do it in many cases. Now, if I have a family where they're not insisting, I don't even start the intravenous. Certainly at home, I don't do this routinely. And here's the formula for the dry mouth and cracking lips, a teaspoon or five milliliters of baking salt, soda, five milliliters of salt and a liter of water. And as well, we need to protect the nares and the lips, Vaseline or another petroleum-based product to minimize evaporation, cracking and drying and pain, it's really important. And I do this every four hours, get the family in the process. Well, what about neurological dysfunction? We talked about that, what happens? The biggest issue for patients is the loss of ability to swallow one of the huge issues because they experience it. Let's listen to what Jamie experienced as part of her amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. But of course, this occurs in most patients approaching the end of their lives. Lots of times it's, it's scary. Um, I've, I've had a lot of trouble with, with the mucus in my throat that is often present with ALS. And I heard about air hunger 
that feeling of suffocation and not being able to breathe. And now I know what that's like because lying in bed at night with my, my arms totally paralyzed and under the covers, I can still move my fingers a little bit, but I can't do much with moving my head and I have to be able to reach the call light. So I've often been panicked and terrified when I feel that in my throat and I don't have the muscles in my throat anymore to either swallow it down or cough it up. So imagine the secretions building up and if you have some awareness, which many patients will have, they get terrified and panicked. You and I know the neurophysiology of this. If you actually examine these patients in the process of dying, they will have lost their gag reflex as well as they've lost their ability to coordinate a swallow. There's a sensory component to this, which doesn't fail as quickly as the motor component. So people can really get distressed by this. You get secretions building up, the major source of which actually come up from trachea. It's not oral secretions, it's tracheal secretions coming up. And particularly if I'm running an intravenous, it can be even worse. You can use postural drainage, putting somebody in Trendelenburg position and turning them on their side. You can use simple repositioning. As you will know, suctioning often doesn't work because the secretions are in trachea and our tube doesn't go beyond larynx, if we can even get into hypopharynx. Much more effective is for us to think about drying the secretions either using glycopyrrolate or scopolamine. And if you have access to a scopolamine patch, it can be helpful, but remember it's low dose. Both of these medications, the glycopyrrolate, the scopolamine, or you could use atropine, can be given 0.1 up to 0.4 milligrams. Titrating to effect, so intravenously every 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or orally every 60 minutes, just the same as our morphine dosing. And then we do it every four hours. Now we don't wanna do this too early because of course patients get the dry mouth and they don't like it. But it needs to be started at the right moment as you see the changes going on. So, that's the swallowing. The other thing that really bothers people that's neurological is changes in respiration. And maybe this bothers more the family who see these than the patients. What we know is if brainstem is not functioning, probably cortex is also not functioning. Cortex tends to fail before brainstem. Let's listen to what happened to Jamie, because of course she has a neurological reason with difficulty swallowing and shortness of breath. I never thought that I would be using drugs like morphine, but it really does help. And it helps relax the throat muscles. It helps me to relax and not tighten up further and the working muscles I have, it helps with pain, it helps put me to sleep. So morphine works for shortness of breath. You probably learned this earlier in your course. I certainly hope so. I know in the world of 
pulmonology in the United States, everybody's really afraid of using morphine for managing shortness of breath. I can't tell you the number of patients who've said to me, why wasn't this done earlier? And in fact, I can share stories of people where we manage their shortness of breath with low dose opioid and they lived much, much longer than was expected. They got better. Again, back to the physiology, neurologically, you and I know what's controlling the breathing. You and I know this whole area surrounded by opioid receptors in the neurological pathway. You and I know there are many different types of breathing patterns and they interrelate with muscles as well as receptors across the face, the baroreceptor, sorry, baroreceptors, the actual muscle and bone joint receptors, the proprioceptors in terms of the inputs, as well as the chemoreceptors. What you and I also know now is that you can modify those receptors by using a little bit of morphine. And when I say a little bit, I really mean small dose. The equivalent of five milligrams of oral morphine is enough to give people a sense of not being short of breath. That's equivalent to a 50 milligram tramadol tablet. If I'm doing it intravenously, it would be two milligrams intravenously. And I can give it routinely. I could use a bit of long acting morphine if they're able to swallow, or I would use it every four hours if I was in a hospital setting. The fears around this are horrible, aren't they? The family gets upset as well. The opioids will really help. And the problem with oxygen is it's useful if the patient is desaturating, but it's not useful by itself as oxygen. In other situations, what we really need is airflow a fan works just as well. Oxygen in the dying process can actually prolong the patient's experience and possibly their suffering. So I just wanted to highlight, Jamie was eager to tell her story. She died, quotes, unexpectedly, even her nurse and family said, oh my goodness, a week after this interview. People need to tell their story and you and I need to be able to listen to it. It's very important. So what else occurs? If you're managing the patient, you may see them get quite agitated and restlessness may ensue. It's because we have cognitive changes going on in our brains as the neurons die, not necessarily all suddenly, they can die a few thousand every minute, but this can take hours to days and we can get terminal delirium. It's actually quite common. Now, in fact, unless somebody dies suddenly, if there is changes, it is going to, for most people, create a hypoactive delirium. For a few people, create a hyperactive delirium. It's part of the dying process. Let's talk about what happens if it's hyperactive. It's the high road, the difficult road. That mumbling, that picking at things, uh, uh, that phonation, the moaning, the groaning. Can you imagine listening to that for four or five days as a family? Horrible. And they perceive it's pain, but it's not really. We don't see stress here which would help us diagnose pain. No furrowing of the eyebrow, no grimace. It's just the vocalization. It's very much a hyperactive delirium. And it can go on to even become myoclonic jerks and seizures, a really horrible situation. You and I can prevent it and manage it. If we're going down the difficult road, our goal is settle the patient. Stop the movement, 
stop the foundation and make sure the person is comfortable. Support, and I'm going to say, different from potentially reversible delirium, where we shouldn't use benzodiazepines at all, benzodiazepines are now perfect. Important that you and I understand the action of these medications. They are sedative anxiolytics. They're amnestics. They block short-term memory production. The patient doesn't remember. Maybe you've had a colonoscopy or another procedure. You've used lorazepam or midazolam. The patient remembers nothing. They must they relax skeletal muscles. The vocal cords are skeletal muscles. If they're a little stressed, we hear the ah, uh, ah, uh, with every exhalation. You can stop it by relaxing those muscles. And of course, they prevent or manage seizures. Opioids are not appropriate here. If you see somebody start opioids, and I've seen doctors start opioids for patients not having any pain, that's a big mistake. It's the fastest way to get the medical examiner or coroner interested in you. Don't do it. Benzodiazepines are water appropriate. I've done this for years. A milligram pre-dissolved in a bit of water placed against the buccal mucosa, or I can use subcutaneous or IV if the form is available, will settle the patient typically with between two and 10 milligrams of lorazepam. And you can see I use a semi-rapid titration technique dosing once every T max once an hour if it's oral against buccal mucosa. And then I schedule every 12 hours, once every half-life, once I've established the dose. There are no clearance concerns. This is inactivated by liver. And if I'm wanting to administer it in a patient who's dying, I put it in a three mil syringe and pre-dissolve it. It's very simple and just put it around the buccal mucosa. Patients are typically lying either straight on their back or up a little bit. It flows down, down esophagus, down trachea. It works very, very well. Now, I could also use midazolam. If I'm doing that in a hospital setting, I need to give a bolus and then do an infusion because the half-life is two hours. I could do it with bolus dosing, but that's too much work for our nursing staff. Let's start a subcutaneous or an intravenous flow. Of course, people say to me, well, are you hastening the patient's death? And I'm going to say to you, absolutely not. If you know the lethal dose of these medications, you will know it's incredibly high. For lorazepam, it's four and a half thousand milligrams per kilogram, and I'm going to use two to 10. All I'm doing is settling the patient and giving them amnesia. And some beautiful work done at St. Christopher's Hospice several years ago showed us that patients whose symptoms are well controlled, good pain control, not agitated, live longer than the patients who are distressed. Distress and stress causes patients to die faster. And of course, I'm trying to create the amnesia. There is no issue of hypotension or respiratory depression here. And as a backup, if you get into trouble, and I have only a very small number of times in my career, we could use phenobarbital or propofol. And I'm happy to share a chapter we wrote on all of this where the details are there, plus our reference cards. Well, that's fine. That's the high road, right? What about the low road, the hypoactive delirium that most patients go down? We know that there's a change in mental status. Are they suffering? And frequently the answer is yes, they may be suffering. They don't necessarily talk to us 
but we've interviewed patients who had hypoactive deliria and they tell us, ooh, it wasn't a good situation. I didn't like it. So the question is, what do we do? Well, they don't come back and talk to us, so we have to use our best judgment. And I would ask you, if you're having bad dreams, nightmares, and hallucinations, would you want a little bit of midazolam to settle you? Or would you like to experience the bad dreams, nightmares, and hallucinations? I suspect the answer is you wouldn't. But of course, for some people, they have very pleasant dreams. They're seeing family come to get them. Well, that's okay. We don't need to manage it. So it becomes judgment. And I suggest you probably wouldn't want the bad dreams, hallucinations, nightmares, most of us. Should I give you a little benzodiazepine to create amnesia? Who would say yes, please? Would you like a little? Yeah, I suspect. Now, it's also important for us to talk to families about what's happening. Most people want to talk to their loved one. When the patient is unconscious, can they hear us? You and I are aware that the center in our brain that hears is different than the one that processes and different than the one that expresses. People can often hear even though they can't speak. So what I say to families is talk to the patient, include them in the conversation, touch them, make them aware. Now, anesthetists know about the eyelash or corneal reflex. That technique they use before they induce paralysis to actually find out is their cortical function or not, I'll teach the family. Is there an eyelash or corneal reflex? If there isn't, this is again, Hans dysfunction, the patient is probably unaware. We can be comfortable communicating with the family. So what I like to say is let's talk to patients, let's include them, let's touch and play the music the patient enjoys. I've seen time and time again, patients waiting for someone special to arrive. They couldn't talk to us, but when the person arrives, you see them relax and they die half an hour or an hour later. It's amazing. So again, back to that permission to die that we talked about early, we need to do this very carefully. So another issue is, will pain get worse during the dying process? And I'm gonna to suggest to you, because pain is perception, the answer is probably not. As we get failure in cognition, pain probably either remains the same or decreases. Now, there's lots of fear. And of course that moaning and groaning that comes with delirium is often misinterpreted. So I can watch right here. It's the last place on someone's face to relax. If I have grimacing and facial stress, maybe try a little bit of an opioid, but otherwise it's probably delirium. Why do you see the white of dying patient's eyes? It's very simple. You and I have a fat pad behind our eyes and in the face of cachexia, it decreases in volume. The fat is reabsorbed. There's insufficient eyelet lid length to go backwards. And it's purely anatomical. As the orbit falls backwards to try to cover the eye, it can't reach it. So what you and I need to do is maintain moisture of the eye using an ophthalmic lubricating gel every four hours. We could use artificial tears or contact lens solution initially, but it only typically lasts 10 or 15 minutes. We need to protect the eye because it can become quite painful. And finally, how often should I turn a dying patient in bed? Well, it turns out that skin 
only survives with ischemia of pressure for 15, 20 minutes. So I really should turn the patient every 20 or 30 minutes. That's a lot of work for families. So we say, turn them at least once an hour. Do that passive range of motion and make sure we're pillowing effectively. Now there's an old nursing tale that it's once every two hours you turn the patient. That's mythology coming from, night, from Florence Nightingale. And the mythology came from the fact that it took her two hours to go around the ward to turn all the patients. We need to manage the pathophysiology here. Skin only survives ischemia for 15 to 20 minutes. Finally, medication use. Reduce the number of medications. Choose the least invasive route in the home, I never use intravenous, subcutaneous or buccomucosa works just fine. I need to remember the kinetics and hopefully you've learned these earlier in the course that Tmax is 15, 30 or 60 minutes depending on the route. And for the opioids, the half-life is four hours, but for lorazepam, the half-life is 12 hours. And if I'm using, uh, Antipsychotic, it's closer to 21 to 24 hours. To get to steady state, we're going to dose every five half-lives. But what we need to recognize is in the face of anuria, we need to stop the opioids because most of them are cleared, cleared by the kidney. Morphine is metabolized into two products by the liver. Morphine three glucuronide, morphine six glucuronide. I will have analgesia until death if the morphine six is around, but I don't want too much of the morphine three because it will cause the central nervous system excitation. These are all kid cleared by the kidney. So in the face of oliguria or anuria, which occurs in the dying process or renal failure or dehydration. If it's less than 500 milliliters of urine per hour, per 24 hours, I need to half the routine dose. If it's less than 250 milliliters, stop routine dosing. You will have analgesia until death. You just don't want to cause delirium from the excitation that can come from the morphine three glucuronide. So it's a brief overview. I'm happy to share my chapter with you. Remember, everyone remembers the care during the last hours of living. You can have done a fabulous job. If the patient dies restless or agitated, people will say it was a horrible death. And they'll remember that forever. And remember that everybody at the bedside, including you, you're watching your own future because one day you too will die. As Gandhi says, let's all be the change we want to see in the world. It starts with us. I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, uh, Frank. So, and uh, the session is open for discussion now. So, if anybody wants to ask any questions. Nothing? What about your challenging patients? Well, thank you. What about managing um, the hi, hi, Sorry. Hi, sir. My, my name is Amelia. Amelia, I, hi. Um, hi. So uh, I would like to ask, um, when we actually do some advanced communication with the family and we expect a patient um, to actually um, succumb to the illness, I have currently a patient who is carcinoma endometrium. She came with a bicarbonate of 2.6. 
and um, she was very unwell. She hadn't passed any urine. The maximum we got was about 50 ml in uh, the 20, first 24 hours. So we had spoken, we, we talked about uh, how um, things are going to progress and that we would keep her comfortable. She didn't have much pain. Um, she was not responding. She was obviously uh, in metabolic encephalopathy at that point of time. The urea was 160, the creat was 6.6. .6. So we'd explained everything. And then we found that as the days went by, we had started on an IV fluids of just 30 ml per hour, like you said, to hydrate and to just keep her going. But her bicarbonate improved. We'd got the nephrologist involved just because they wanted to have an opinion. And they had given a bit of soda bicarb. And we find now that she's actually improved um, where the objective values of creatinine and urea are. She's pouring out 1.5 liters of urine but she has not come out of her encephalopathy. So now what has happened is we have a patient who is comatose, she's lying there. And every day the relatives, what they ask is, when is it going to end? You said it was gonna happen and she's pulling on. So why is she pulling on? And that becomes very, very difficult to answer. So what would you do? Uh, what do you do in such a situation, sir? Well, and I think that uh, a little bit of the answer is we're keeping her going, isn't it? Uh, so let's us understand what we're doing here. Um, what is causing her to die? Was it actually the biochemical changes that you now managed and you're giving her fluid? So you're actually sustaining her. Let's be clear ourselves. Yes. Patients often die when they don't have fluid on board. My lady who lived almost four weeks, she was absorbing her ascites. She was delirious the whole time, low level, but it was sort of a mumbling hypo hyperactive mixed delirium. Well, here's so your we lady, unconscious. Sorry, go, please yeah. go ahead. We'd stop the fluids for 24 hours, but it became very distressing for the family. And like and why said, is it, why is they, it distressing for the family? They said, you're not giving anything. Um, you're not actually even giving fluids and we're in hospital and how is she, uh, how can we, we, are, we can't sit in front of her and we can't drink and we can't eat if you're not giving her anything. So uh, at least give her a little bit. So we tried talking and then we realized that they were getting too uh, distressed which meant that if we didn't support, at least in some way, we felt that they would then go on to always remember that we never gave her any fluid towards the end. We even offered um, saying that instead of putting her fluids, do you think we could just feed her? You could put a rice tube and just give her just about 50 ml. Um, and they said, no, she told us before she was sick that she doesn't want any tubes in her. So then we were left with thinking, okay, we can't put in Ryle's tube. We can't give too much. We'll just give between 20 to 30. And from nowhere, she was, um, you know, um, she started pouring out urine. Her creat is actually 1.6 now. Um, urea has come down and we stuck. <laughs> so it's well, a you've, little bit. <laughs> you, you've uh, reversed the physiological problem. That was but part what of have I ended process. up with is a question. <laughs> Well, sure, and you, but you, you need to understand the physiology first, yes, and the yes. path of physiology, and you've reversed it. You've given her enough fluid to sustain her slowly. She will absorb it, but much more slowly. And the issue becomes one of why is the family distressed? What are they understanding? And we need to go into that. They're distressed because they love her. They're distressed because they want to protect her. They want the best possible care. And they're distressed because they really don't want to lose her. Those are the conversations that we need to begin to have with them and calling it out. They won't understand the physiology, pathophysiology, will they? I'm assuming they're not medical uh, no. people. So again, we need to make it very simple and for them to understand that this is going to go on for a while. People die because of deficiencies. People die because of cognitive failure. Uh, 
But if they have nutrition and they have fluids, they can stay in a state of unconsciousness for a long time. So again, it's this sitting down and beginning with the family to say, I see you're distressed, talk to me about why you're distressed. And it's not because we're not doing something. Why are they really distressed? Well, they don't want her to die, but they want her to die, but they don't want her to die, but they want her to die. Let's talk about all that. It's a very hard, well, it's a very hard conversation, isn't it? It is a very hard conversation and there are probably gonna be a lot of tears and I'm gonna go for the tears. I wanna see the tears. Want to get, and then I can begin to say, well, what's that all about? Oh, Amelia, what a great question. It's a tough one, isn't it? It is. Yeah, this is one of the hardest parts of medicine is this fluids and nutrition piece because it's about love. And when you've been feeding somebody and giving them fluids all your life, and it's our social world. I can't, I can't eat and drink in front of her. Well, well, is she even aware? Probably not. So again, we need to help them with that. But this is where the suffering is for families. I would love it that you raised it. What else? Uh, thank, uh, there is a question. <clears throat> Dr. Vijay Radhan uh, is asking whether an airbag will be okay instead of hourly training of the patient. Sure, so good question. So there's no question that we should be using an air mattress for patients um, and that will help distribute the pressure differently. Uh, we still need to turn people. If you go to one of those uh, pressure reducing beds, which are the fancy ones with all the cushions with motorized uh, filling and reducing of the cushions, then we get more time when we don't need to move the patient. Uh, but part of the turning, just to be aware, is about the pressure on the skin and the reduction of risk of pressure ulcers. Part of the turning is actually moving the joints and muscles and getting past the proprioceptors, which can be causing patients a lot of distress. If you've never done it, I'd like you to lie in bed today or tomorrow for half an hour and don't move. Don't move anything and see what it feels like. I bet you won't like it. You'll be saying, oh, I have to move. But the same thing's happening for patients. So part of the turning is keeping those joints moving and letting the proprioceptor say, ah, they moved. I don't have to send any signals. So airbed could be helpful. There was an earlier question as well. What about refractory cough? Yeah, yeah. If I may uh, come back to that one. That's kind of challenging, isn't it? And again, it's the what's the cause of the cough? Uh, we need to try to understand that because there are many different causes, part of which may be simply the secretions. So do I need to dry the secretions or try to move them by using uh, postural drainage? Uh, that could become very important. Good nursing can help us with that a lot. Uh, but of course, it can also be a reflex. And is it gag? Well, that may disappear, but can I settle it? We know that medications like codeine um, can be very helpful here. Morphine can help, but not as good as codeine uh, if we can administer it to the patient. Uh, and maybe we actually need the benzodiazepines uh, to reduce that cough experience. Now, cough is another whole topic for us, uh, but it's kind of challenging, I agree. Uh, and will it change as the patients move into the dying process? And that, particularly if we've had a refractory cough and we've been doing a variety of things to try to manage it, if they're now not able to swallow, some of those medications aren't available to us, are they? Um, what I've seen is benzodiazepines or the barbiturates, a small dose of phenobarbital may help that. I've also used codeine um, and I've been able to administer it parenterally. That has helped as well. Uh, that's a challenge one. That's, that's a tough one. 
So again, back to the what's the cause. Another great question. And you recite spiritual, is it uh, shloka? How do you say it, shlokas? Yeah. Shlokas, yes. Well, of course, those become very important, don't they? So there's this whole context of rites and rituals and prayers of a spiritual context for somebody. It's beautiful. What we need to do is ask, who are they? What do they want? And we need to ask early. And if we miss the opportunity for rites and rituals, ooh, that can be problematic in the belief system of patients and families. So it's important that we encourage them. It's why I say we need to be able to, you and I, the doctor, needs to be able to say to the patient and family, there's a change going on. We need to prognosticate, we need to diagnose and prognosticate appropriately. Because if family miss the opportunity for this, ooh, it could not be good in their mind. But you and I need to clearly say these things. And sometimes people feel that's really hard to do. Maybe, but it's also really important to do. Another great comment. What else do you have for me? Thank you, uh, Frank. Um, we have a case presentation to discuss. I think, uh, shall we move on to that and have, continue the discussions after the presentation? Okay. Dr. Amelia? Can, um, uh, can you see it? Uh, yes, ma'am, we can see it. Can you make it into present? Yeah, perfect, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I work as a senior specialist in pain and palliative medicine at a corporate hospital in Bangalore. So um, I'm going to talk about a patient of ours. He was a 60-year-old gentleman uh, diagnosed to have interstitial lung disease and type 2 respiratory failure post a low respiratory tract infection. He was a diabetic and a hypertensive. So we first saw him in a palliative OPD with the following uh, symptoms. He came in saying, I'm increasingly fatigued, bed bound, uh, though he hadn't reported any fever. He said that he was unable to speak to his family for more than three words at a time. He hadn't been able to take orally enough and also showed no interest in taking things orally. The bathroom was adjacent to his bedroom, but even then he was unable to walk to it without oxygen and he would come coughing into bed and would sleep off because of exhaustion of even having had that small activity. Constipated, kept waking at night uh, with a start. So the son would always say, I had to sleep next to him because he'd be fast asleep and then he'd suddenly get up completely panicked, looking around the room. And then the son had to reassure him that he's there, everything's okay, go back to sleep. It would take some time before the patient then went back to sleep, but that would happen at least about two, three times in the night, which meant nobody was actually getting a good night's rest. Uh, he'd had no nausea, vomiting, but the only thing he would ask his son is help me breathe, help me breathe. So to just to go back into the history of the illness, patient was actually treated by the pulmonology team for the past three years for ILD, and he had been presenting with complaints of inability to walk uh, as much as he used to and cough and things like that. And the last time he had been treated was two months ago, and he had come become lost to follow up till the present presentation. So um, he had been admitted uh, two months prior to what we saw him, uh, 10 days prior to what we saw him. And he had been admitted with high fever, inability to breathe. Uh, they had actually investigated uh, and found that he had a low respiratory tract infection. They also found that he'd been non-compliant to the medications they had been giving him, such as inhaler, steroids, and antibiotics. So as for the request from the family, he was admitted into the ICU. He had non-invasive ventilation. They gave him antibiotics, all the supportive care that was needed. He was shifted to the ward after he was stable on four liters of oxygen through nasal prongs. He was discharged home. We didn't get a reference at that point of time. He was told you can go home 
and meet the pain and palliative team 10 days after when you come for review with us. And that's the pulmonology team. So that was the history that he had come with, the first slide that I presented. So on examination, how did we find him? He was hunched over in his wheelchair, forward, bending forward. Uh, on nasal prongs, he had a cylinder that was placed between his legs on the wheelchair. Looked extremely tired, and he was now receiving five liters of oxygen. He had pallor, clubbing, bilateral pitting pedal edema. Um, he used to be able to sit up for um, uh, just a few, just a couple of hours. So more than 50% of the time he was in bed and he could feed himself, but very briefly because he either had to breathe or he had to eat. He couldn't do both of them together. So he got exhausted. He was not delirious. His GCS was 15 by 15. He was tachypnic, tachycardic. Blood pressure was all right. Uh, his mouth was coated. Uh, xerostomia was there because he was mouth breathing as well. Nasal cavity was dried and crusted, though it was, there was no bleeding. He was using accessory muscles of respiration. Chest expansion was reduced on the left side. Otherwise, bilateral scattered creps and wheeze was there. Abdomen was fine. Bowel sounds were present. So what did we do? Uh, so we just, because it's just 10 days prior that he'd had all his investigations, we went through that. He had had all this uh, done, the lung function test, the ABG, PBC, renal profile, sputum, blood cultures, everything had been treated. And just prior to his discharge from the hospital, they were all within normal limits. So from the time we saw him in the OPD, the only thing we asked of him was a renal function test and a total bilirubin mainly because we felt that it was time that we put him on a low dose of opioids, of morphine. So we wanted to have a baseline investigation done before we com commenced on this medication. I'm just gonna go through a few of the psychosocial aspects that he faced. Pre-morbid wise, he was always, he's described by his family as a very independent person, very dominant at home, always got his way in control. He had a son and two daughters. Daughters were married, but son was yet to be, and that he felt was a responsibility he hadn't yet fulfilled. So it was an unfinished business for him. Wife was a diabetic, hypertensive, very docile, calm person who was completely dependent on her husband. Now, currently, what he felt was he's extremely dependent on his family, anger that he was unable to take care of himself, frustrated because of the lack of quality and dignity of life, unable to do 95% of his activity of daily living by himself, frustrated that he had caused his son to take many loans, and the extended family was not supporting his son, so that angered him, and he convinced himself that he's going to die the most distressing death, and uh, the nights were more difficult for him because these thoughts kept coming to his mind. And he was afraid to be alone, afraid that he would be dying alone, afraid that nobody would be there. So we actually used a interdisciplinary approach. We got the psychologists involved. We got the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, the nutritionist. We got everybody involved and tried to support them as much as possible, uh, talk to them as much, as much as possible. But that was the first OPD visit. There was very little we could do in that time. The whole process of getting everybody involved took us almost half a day before we could talk, find out, and do things. So we made a plan. Pharmacologically, what we said was we started him on morphine, immediate release tablets, five milligrams, every fourth hourly should he need it, with a complete tablet at night. Over a period of time, uh, currently what had happened was he was taking enough for us to actually say, let's go on to a long acting tab, uh, morphine uh, medication, control release tablet. We thought that actually 10 milligrams would be sufficient twice a day, but he was taking much more than that. We continued on all these adjuvant medications, including pregabalin, duloxetine, because the psychologist has actually done the uh, anxiety scoring and the hospital anxiety and depression scoring, found him to be severely depressed and moderately anxious. We started him on a bit of benzodiazepine at night to calm him down so he could sleep, constipation medications, and gave him the SOS medications. 
Now, the main concerns that he expressed were breathlessness, distress, anger, constipation. So we put it down as these were the points that we had to address if we had to give him some peace of mind and sort out his family's anxiety. The main thing that we found very difficult was he was not willing to come back to hospital. He wanted to be only at home and not willing to get admitted. Even if he got more breathless, he said, I've had enough. And was probably because of the financial issues that the son was facing. The other thing was that we had actually, with all of these, we had uh, spoken to the pulmonologist at that point, the team. And the concern was that if we started on benzodiazepines, it would actually cause a suppression of the carbon dioxide drive. And hence, uh, it would not, it would worsen the COPD picture is what the feeling was. So in summary, I have a 60 year old gentleman diagnosed to have ILD, type two respiratory failure. He had been under the pulmonologist uh, for about three and a half years before the palliative team got to meet him. He was already at a point where he had become totally distressed, uh, completely angry, psychosocial issues were plenty. Um, and um, being oxygen dependent and be completely distressed with a high symptom burden. We tried, we tried our best at that point of time to do whatever we could because we knew we just had that one day, but that was a lot to try and, con to try and put into because that's providing the care was more of a gradual, um, repeated uh, conversation that we had to have. We finally landed up with having some teleconsultations, but it would always be the son who spoke to us and he would never. We tried a combination of medications, always hands being tied that we couldn't use the benzodiazepine. So what I would like to ask, because this is a pulmonology forum, is to say, would have, would, what, what would you feel as the palliative team be involved at the time when he was admitted into the ICU rather than meeting us 10 days after discharge? Because while he was in hospital, it would have given us a little more time to actually understand him, speak to him and make a plan as to what needs, needs to be done. Would a family meeting prior to discharge home, is that something that is that we could look forward to as uh, an interdisciplinary management. Are benzodiazepines contraindicated? Can, because as mentioned uh, to, in today's class as well, anxiety, breathlessness, these, it does work. And your goal of care changes if he's in an advanced state. So what is it and what would be acceptable by the team? And addressing death anxiety at home, do you have any supporting ways in which we could do it? And how can we provide a combined home care support for a patient in the Indian perspective? Because what we have and what we can do in a Western uh, context is very different to what we have available here with the financial constraints that this family has. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amelian. Wonderful uh, discussion points we have uh, put across. I, I, it, it, very interested to know what pulmonologists think about the integration and the combined approach in the home care. And yeah, this is the right forum to ask this question. Yes. So, waiting to listen from you all. There are a few chats also. Uh, Dr. Priya is telling, yes, surely in ICU and benzodiazepine can be given and see how to respond. And difficult to assess at home. Anyone else would uh, like to comment on what Dr. Amelia was discussing before we ask Frank about what he thinks? Rajmi and uh, Raja, ma'am, please. <laughs> uh, I missed something uh, a little bit earlier, Amelia. If you can just, I'm sorry, I'm just problem with my audio, but you mentioned something about ICU. Uh, what was the question about what was the intervention that you were checking? No, uh, so this pa patient had been lost to follow up to two months and he had worsened in those two months of when he was at home and been non-compliant. And uh, the CT scans could show that he was worsening. The patient was admitted for at least 10 days to two weeks in the ICU setting and followed by a ward. 
But when the patient got discharged, uh, we got a ref the reference was raised saying, come and meet the pain and palliative team 10 days later when you come back to review us. So my question is, um, I understand this is a new marriage that we're actually having. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but how do we go about it to um, combine the two, your strengths and our strengths? And when would be the right time to join these two strengths? I think if we've had a series of talks, I know, but every situation is different. So what would you be looking forward from the palliative team in the Indian context? Okay. Um, so I think, I think it's, uh, you know, I think as Priya mentioned, uh, surely that hospitalization when they require the first hospitalization is definitely one of the times you mentioned that the patient has, you know, when, when you have a patient with interstitial lung disease, uh, it has an uncertain trajectory. A lot of patients who are admitted for exacerbations with respiratory failure, acute on chronic respiratory failure with interstitial lung disease, that very first hospitalization itself, you have as high as a 50% mortality. So that's telling us something about the trajectory of the disease. Of course, many of them will recover after that. But if we haven't done the ideal of introducing the palliative care team to a patient with interstitial lung disease already earlier during the diagnosis and care of the patient, this would definitely be a time to do it. When would be the right time to do it? I never think it's a good time to call the palliative care team to do the difficult conversation, which I should have done with my patients and their family before. But once they are slightly better before the discharge, introducing them at that time, rather than saying, come back after 10 days. One of the greatest burdens that patients face when they are severely sick is our transport to the hospital itself. It's so, so, uh, it's, it's so burdensome, not just for the patient, for the family member, caregiver, arranging transport, you're worried about oxygen failing on you in the middle of transport. There's so many anxieties that you need to take care of and set up the home care plan before discharge. There's no doubt in my mind that that's the thing. In terms of benzodiazepines, you know, when the patient's transferred from the ICU to the ward, as uh, mentioned earlier, it's already, you've got, the op you've got the opportunity to help to titrate the doses of benzodiazepines and opioids. And we now know that even if not for the chronic breathlessness for long-term in ILD, definitely for the severe episodic breathlessness, um, we can use both benzos and opioids and they are effective in reducing the overall symptom burden and improving the quality of life absolutely at the end of life. So, uh, and more importantly, um, while the studies have not shown us that they may be as beneficial in reducing dyspnea alone, the studies have also shown us that low dose benzos are safe enough to use without that worry of respiratory depression, right? So I don't think this is a common misconception amongst my own community. I'm very aware of this, Amelia, that, you know, some of us are outliers in being uh, comfortable with the use of liberal use of low dose benzodiazepines yes. and low dose opioids. Let, it, let me very clear about the evidence too. The mortality is with high dose benzodiazepines, um, not with low dose. And what we need for dyspnea uh, and uh, sleep and cough in our respiratory patients is far lower than the doses we use for pain um, in, the, in other hundred percent, 100%. You just put it, we, we just put it on an SOS basis. It's not even that you have to put it in. And then if they are, then they take it. And many times you get away with, well, this patient is different. He had other issues, but um, normally, just about once or twice a day, yeah. they take it. I, I'd agree with you happens. completely on that because, again, even with the evidence, uh, the episodic breathlessness relief with the benzos and opioids has been shown to be better at the terminal stage of the stage. And actually, the uh, I think it, it was a very good thing uh, that um, I think Dr. Rajam had actually spoken about the functioning thinking breathlessness model. Uh, I think that goes a very long way. Yeah. We've actually started giving it to the family so that they can actually go yeah. through it. Yeah. And too much information in one day, but if they go through that picture, they have a very good understanding about the arrows and how everything's interlinked. 
so many times you get away with your non-pharmacological measures for breathlessness. You very rarely have to dip into a pharmacological measures, 90% of the time. I, I, I think Dr. Miriam did a wonderful talk on that. And that's, um, so yeah. I've, I've seen this, that I get referrals for patients who have advanced COPD and ILD uh, from colleagues who will say that they're referring to me for prescribing opioids. Uh, because of a level of comfort with prescribing opioids. And it probably takes me another three to six months before I think they need opioids because there's so much more non-pharmacological to do before then. And actually, that's a good time to help the patient's caregivers. I think you, stress, you, you touched upon important points in the caregiver stress here as well. Uh, their worries about managing oxygen and the episodic breathlessness that happens and their worry about not being able to care adequately. Uh, my uh, one thing that I do offer our patients is that sometimes the caregiver burden is too much for them to manage at home. And in such situations, we leave the option to the patient to decide if they would want hospital to be a place of death. Very often, um, you know, hospices for patients with purely respiratory conditions, we don't have that uh, available as an option for many of our patients. Um, and if the burden of caregiving is so great that we're not going to be adequately controlling symptoms in the home setting, um, we, we used to offer that they can come in for the very end of life and have the support of the nursing team at the end of life. Uh, so I think that's another option. And someone mentioned about telehealth. And I think in the last two years with the, with the COVID pandemic, we've all learned how we can be much better at telehealth. I do find it always easier if I have seen the patient once um, uh, in at least in the recent, you know, maybe at least within three to six months, it gives me an idea. Three months is like the maximum, especially because they decline quite rapidly at times. Um, but home visits um, or at least one visit and then after that managing with telehealth because you know then what the patient and what the caregiver are saying. You have a frame of reference after one visit. Uh, and you can support for a great deal of the adjustment of medications and things like that with telehealth. I agree. Dr. Uh, Frank, um, I wanted to ask about death anxiety. Uh, what are you asking? How do you manage at home? Well, what's the, the issue? What, mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the background issue that's causing the death anxiety? the panic that he's going to have a very painful um, or like a drowning death, mm -hmm. but the patient refuses to come to hospital. So there's a limit on what we do not do intravenous morphine at home. Subcutaneous drivers are not available. So we have to rely on just the oral preparations or sure. if they're taking home care, then a nurse. Uh, but even then, uh, IV opioids are not available at home at the present, at this current moment. Sure. So managing it at home uh, with a tense family and the death anxiety, would you have any tips that we could help them? Sure. So let's go back to what was the dose of morphine that the patient was receiving? So he had started off with 5-MG SOS every fourth hourly, but he required it continuously and SOS. We landed up finally needing to give him 20 in the morning and 30 at night. Control and that's... Release. And that's the controlled release, yes. right? So again, you're not giving him a very high dose of morphine, are you really? Yeah. And again, is he absorbing it appropriately or is it better for him uh, to be given the immediate release products because he'll absorb them more readily? Never forget that the buccomucosa root is functional until death uh, in almost all of our patients. So we don't have to give parenteral products, even during the dying process, we can continue to give the medication against the buccal mucosa. At remembering what I said right at the end, that uh, you have clearance concerns. So if you're not urinating, you're still going to have the dose of morphine that you gave before active and on board, because it's going to be the morphine sick glucuronide. So that's the opioid story. And just being clear about the pharmacokinetics and the clearance concerns related to that 
you know, some of our patients have gone up to needing 20 or 30 milligrams of oral morphine equivalents every four hours. It's still a very small dose compared to what we use for pain management. Uh, so that's the first part. There's no question as patients like this get to the uh, end of their lives, there is a death anxiety component to it. Let's remember what the benzodiazepines will do. They have four actions and maybe even some of you have experienced it. If you've had a procedure or a colonoscopy, they're anxiolytic sedatives, they are amnestics, they are skeletal muscle relaxants, and they are going to prophylax or prevent or stop seizures. So they're anticonvulsants. In the end of life experience, what we're interested in is the amnesia, particularly. Uh, and uh, we can create amnesia. Again, I don't know whether you've ever had a procedure. Uh, I had my colonoscopy with three milligrams of midazolam. I remember absolutely nothing. So the dosing for these patients is actually relatively small. And our goal is making sure they are completely unaware. It will not change the tachypnea that the family might watch. Uh, they may still see reflex responses and we need to teach them about that. But my experience is, and if I'm in the hospital-based setting, I'm going to use five milligrams of midazolam. If I'm in the uh, home setting, I'm going to use two to five milligrams of lorazepam as my starting point. Uh, and I will titrate to the point where I have a patient who is unresponsive uh, and I know they're going to have amnesia. Now those patients may still have a bit of an eyelash reflex or they may lose their eyelash reflex. Uh, but I'm pretty comfortable that uh, using benzodiazepines, and I'll titrate to effect, Tmax is 60 minutes uh, till I see the patient is comfortable, and then I'll use it every 12 hours. Uh, again, my goal is amnesia. That patient is dying. I don't, I'm not worried about the respiratory depression. The patient is dying. Uh, I'm expecting them to die. Plus, I do know that benzo, I'm, I'm curious about the quotes Benzodiazepines cause respiratory depression. I, I'm not aware of the literature showing us that. I think what it does do is it relaxes the patients. And if they don't have a drive, well, they may not be breathing as much because they're now much more relaxed. That's a different story from actually suppressing the respiratory control center. Because uh, I'm aware that, again, there's that tension between now they're so relaxed that they're not breathing and they don't have that anxiety uh, as opposed to I'm suppressing the respiratory control center. Again, with lorazepam, remember that the LD50 is four and a half thousand milligrams per kilogram in rats and the midazolam, it's 215 milligrams per kilogram in rats, the LD50. And you heard me say my midazolam dose, even for ventilator withdrawal, is five milligrams of midazolam. In one case, have I used 10 milligrams in somebody who's naive? So I need to teach the family. So I want to address your other part of the question. What about the family's anxiety about the death? I need to teach the family that they may still see the tachypnea and the reflex breathing, but the patient will be unaware. Uh, Rajani, I see your hand. I've actually noticed that in some of our patients with uh, in, in the active dying process, when they come into the hospital because they want greater support, uh, and if they are opioid naive or benzo naive, that very first low dose benzo uh, opioid or benzodiazepine that you give, and these are patients who are maybe patients who've been on. Uh, high flows of oxygen or been using non-invasive ventilation at home, the, the, that first dose relaxes them so well that they're not craving the non-invasive ventilation mask. They're able to come off that to nasal cannula. They're able to have conversations with family members. And those last two days actually become memorable days of conversation. 
I think oh, it's I, really more about training the family members to stop watching the saturation, only look at the expression on I the agree. face. But, and I want to challenge all of you, shouldn't we have used the morphine earlier? So if I was teaching you dyspnea, and I know Rajam has seen this video, I would show you the story of a woman with very advanced pulmonary fibrosis. We thought she was dying. Literally, we said two to four weeks that she would survive. We gave her low dose opioids. She lived for another 18 months and she got back to life. If we're holding off on the opioids and we're focused just on the oxygen, et cetera, are we missing an opportunity? Because I think what Rajani says is absolutely right. When you give people the right dose of an opioid, they do much better. Now, I would personally avoid the benzodiazepines uh, until I'm at that refractory dyspnea stage because benzodiazepines are contraindicated in the elderly. They cause amnesia. They're gonna make the forgetfulness worse. Plus they cause skeletal muscle relaxation. The elderly get up, they forget, they fall, they break something or they have an accident. Don't use benzodiazepines unless you're really trying to create short-term memory blockade. It's perfect for that. You're, you, patients with lorazepam or midazolam, they don't remember. And you know it from the outpatient procedures. I'm sure you use them in India all over the place. So uh, be careful about that. I, I think, and again, I, I see my pulmonology colleagues uncomfortable to start this early, remember that five milligrams of oral morphine is only a tramadol tablet. A 50 milligram tramadol, it's nothing. Uh, what? If, you're, if you're really worried in the elderly, start 2.5 milligrams of oral morphine equivalents. I bet it will make a difference. So again, I think your question, Amelia, is really perfect. And again, you asked the question about telemedicine. I love telemedicine for this because I can be with the family routinely in the home. I can spend 10 minutes with them. And if they know I'm coming, boy, it settles their anxiety. Now it's not perfect for everybody. Uh, and I know there are some people who have to die in hospital. Okay, fine. I know there's some people who have to die in the ICU with a tube in every single orifice. Okay, fine. I still do the same things. But I found most patients in our world actually do die at home. But it's starting these medications and for the family, it's making sure these medications are in the home before they need them. So we have what we call an emergency pack of medications and we keep it in the refrigerator so everybody can find it. It's only a find issue. It's not that it has to be cold. Just if the nurse is coming or somebody else is coming, everybody knows to look in the fridge. Is that helpful, Amelia or Rajani? Does helpful. that fit with your experience? <laughs> it is very helpful. Thank you. No, know, I've, I've picked up many pointers in the last hour and a half. Thank you so much. This is very, very useful. Thank you. My pleasure. Rajam, you've seen this before. What's your comment? So I think, thank you very much, Frank. It's always lovely to hear you. And I, like Rajni said, I, we all, I always pick up one or two points from you. And I think one of the things we need to realize as pulmonologists is certain things we need to unlearn to pick up new things. I think we are so um, ingrained in the way we are taught. And I think we are never taught about death and dying. We are not taught to talk about it. And we are not even taught to this, think about it in our heads because it's always save, save, save. And I think we really need to go beyond that. And I think the pandemic has really taught us of how fragile life is and how uh, brought death and dying into sharp focus. So as pulmonologists, you know, we need to realize that it's not the quantity of life that we should be focusing on. We need to sit and talk to the needs of our patients and family. And like they all mentioned, you know, devise ways of being there 
for your patients because anxiety levels stress levels all that can be really much better managed not just for the patient the caregivers even your own anxiety every time you get a distress call from a patient's family your blood pressure also rises you react and not necessarily in a pleasant way if you've done these discussions well ahead of time unhurriedly sensitively they are prepared better you are prepared better i think it makes the whole care experience a much better uh, situation and not stressful at all times and it's really helpful from my experience i would say the pulmonologist who do refer patients to me in the hospitals i work i think we, because of the shared care the stress levels for both is much less and we meet the families together we discuss difficult issues together and the families know that if i'm not available the primary pulmonary pulmonologist or the primary consultant is available so there's no sense of abandonment etc somebody is there to pick up the patients and the caregivers so i think it's very important to learn these small nuances and that's what i love about dr frank stocks is he involves and intricately dissolves pharmacology in treatment and that's very important because we don't know why we are giving uh, which tablet how much in what frequency and it really uh, empowers you that you're very safe in giving xyz dose and there is really no cause for concern so that is very important and i've learned a lot from all his videos and i'm sure if you google search frank there is so much in the uh, in the net that you will learn and i have learned a lot though i've probably met him only once or twice but there's so much to learn from him thank you once again and thank you all for uh, joining in and may i take two more minutes to answer two more questions that appeared here if i would so a question came up about what about morphine and chronic liver disease um, so the reality is even in advanced cirrhosis we see that the glucuronidation process actually continues quite effectively uh, so if somebody has normal liver enzymes, I wouldn't hesitate to use opioids. Uh, and then in advanced disease, uh, I may need to adjust by reducing the dose or changing the frequency slightly. <coughs> Excuse me. But my experience is I just titrate to a uh, And I'm, I'm doing that, you know, carefully. Uh, so that would be my first thought. Uh, don't hesitate. Uh, and do try to, to affect. Somebody asked about moving the family to the foot end of the bed, yes. Because if people are trying to shovel food in someone's mouth, that's not very helpful. But people need to do something. So get them down to the other end of the bed, get them telling stories, get them doing massage, get them turning the patient, um, and get them telling the patient how much they love them and engage with them. Uh, the reminiscence, the bringing in pictures, if there happen to be pets, bringing in the pets and enjoying each other. Uh, so, so important for that. So, uh, and I would be happy to share the video on last hours of life uh, with all of you uh, that we crafted as well as the chapter. Who should I send that to? Should I send that to Sunil? And you can pass it on to everybody? Yes, sir. I will do that. What a pleasure to be with all of you. Namaste. And, uh, I look forward to the next chance. I'm actually going to Rajam. I'm going to be in Mumbai on the 8th, 9th, 10th of May. Maybe we can be and meet. I would look forward to that. You will be you will be in very, very warm weather. So very, very warm. I, I, I know, very warm weather. Hot, hot, hot. <laughs> I know. <laughs> what a delight Sam, to be with you. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> for the wonderful, wonderful session. A lot of uh, learnings. Thank you so much for uh, being a part of this program.